Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Center for Global Development. Very, very excited that you're here today on this uh, topic. Um, my name is Judy Moore. I'm a visiting fellow here at the Center for Global Development. I was the Minister of Public Works in Liberia um, up to about a year ago. And then we had an election. You know, these things happen. <laughs> but um, we're very, very happy to have this panel to discuss this really, really important topic about how channeling private money into uh, um, the sustainable development goals, into public infrastructure. Um, you have the bios of the members of the panel, and because it is such a dynamic panel, I would just like to uh, just get into it. Uh, first, uh, Suma is the head of the European Bank for uh, uh, Reconstruction and Development. And I, the, the first question I wanted to pose was, it's been four years since Addis. The meeting in Addis was meant to um, channel a path towards financing the sustainable development goals. And yet, uh, here we are today, four years later, we still haven't seen the quantity of money from the private sector that we expected to come. What happened? If we were to have the same panel five years from today, what needs to happen for us to be able to have different outcomes and different results? Well, we've clearly uh, got to up our game. I think um, in terms of the question, I'd say, it is full of promise still, but we're way, way behind on delivery, for sure. Okay. And business as usual will not do it. Um, I think we all know the numbers, so I won't repeat them. In terms of achieving the SDGs, uh, we need private sector financing, private sector delivery. This isn't to say, by the way, that I don't think it's, uh, there's an important role for uh, national resources, from the budget, uh, there, is, there is, and there is also for grant aid as well. Uh, not least in certain sectors like health and education, certain types of countries like fragile and conflict states, without a doubt. But in terms of uh, Africa, without a doubt, we do need more private sector financing to come in. Um, we in EBRD, we've been in uh, North Africa uh, for only, what, six and a half years. And I think we have shown that our business model, which is very focused on the private sector, can be made to work and can leverage in uh, private sector financing from others as well. Uh, you know, it's quite striking in that six and a half years, we've now, I think it's ten and a half billion dollars we've now invested across these countries. Uh, this is Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, and now very recently Lebanon. Uh, but look, ten and a half billion in six and a half years, and within that time, last year Egypt became our largest, our number one market. It overtook Turkey last year. Uh, in, so this can be done. Um, and if I take the example of Egypt, and particularly renewables, um, I mean, my colleague back there somewhere is Nandita, who the managing director for this area. But the work we've done with the Egyptian government on renewables is, is actually very interesting because it shows how to do it, I think. First of all, it's very important to have a sense of the right regulatory framework, right policy framework okay. that would make investors want to come uh, to you. And then you have to work very hard both the government, but also the private sector and EBRD to really structure the projects that would work. In our case, uh, this has worked really well. I would, I would cite the famous Benban Solar Park. You know, this is Africa's largest solar park now, I think. And we financed 16 projects there, but only after doing all that hard work on the regulatory environment in the first place. So that really worked very well. And I think uh, we're not alone because, because we were able to go in there IFC came in with us as well, and others as well. So we were le leveraging other people mm. as well to because they got comfort from the fact that EBRD could make this work. Um, so I think that's very important. And I, I took sort of, I tried to write down for myself a few lessons from that. I think one is you've got to have a government that is really committed to making the private sector come in. And there's a lot of lip service paid. Uh, in many places, you, you have nice national development plans which say we want more private sector development, but making it happen is fundamental. And so having, uh, it's wonderful Sahar is actually on the panel, she can attest to this, having a government uh, that really did want to make this happen and could facilitate it was, was fundamental. Secondly, I think um, it's absolutely crucial that an MDB like Ibiadi goes in there to catalyze other uh, investors. Otherwise, I think a lot of them wouldn't have come in. And thirdly, you cannot do this without having skin in the game yourself. The reason they would come in is because uh, our staff and our, you know, we were putting our money into this as well and taking the risk. Uh, otherwise, why would they bother? 
Mm. So I think it's very important. But I think some other things that we've learned, not just from Egypt, but from the region, North Africa, is we have to put a lot more stress on project preparation than we ever used to do in the past. Mm. A lot more stress. I mean, weirdly, this is beginning to take me back, <laughs> you know, 40 years when I started in development. I see so many friends here from, from that time. I mean, it's, uh, this is what I used to do when I first left university and went to Botswana to work there, was work on project preparation. <laughs> and uh, this, it's not that the lack of finance so much, it's actually structuring these projects in a way. And we started off with this um, infrastructure project preparation facility, and it sort of putted along, it was okay, but it wasn't really doing this as a business. And I think we realized that this project preparation has to be even more upstream than, uh, than we thought. We couldn't just be the recipient of ideas. We had to actually work with ministries, with the private sector, much more upfront. Secondly, you've got to be able to really try and develop local currency lending in these countries. Um, and this is very important. So a big, big push on EBRD's part in North Africa to develop local uh, capital markets uh, and local currency lending. And it's no accident, I think, EBRD's ended up last year with 40% of our debt finance deals were in local currency way ahead of other multilaterals, because it's the only way to make this work, I think, properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and thirdly, I think, working up these innovative risk mitigation instruments as well that we've done in a num number of, you know, we've got this thing with MEGA now, a joint risk mit mitigation scheme that is really, really important. So all of that is crucial, and it's bloody hard work, frankly, mm -hmm. to make it happen. But I think we're showing, in Egypt in particular, but in also the other countries, that you can make it happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm still confident. Yeah, we're behind schedule. Uh, and business as usual won't do, but here are some ingredients that could make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kabaruka, yes. um, even though we haven't seen the volume of private sector money coming into these projects, we've seen that um, a number of African countries have found a way still to capital markets. Um, this year, we crossed the 100 billion mark in terms of urban issues from, uh, from African countries. Um, by 2010, I think, it used to be about 10 countries. Now we've got 21, including the latest being Benin. So there's nothing that's preventing these countries from absorbing that money that they get through Eurobond issues and being able to invest in uh, uh, infrastructure or in social services. But what we've seen is a significant amount of that borrowing has gone to fiscal balances and just running the budget. So first, is this an, a pathway to be able to attract private money into um, investment in uh, countries in Africa? But are we running the risk of a second debt crisis in terms of going that, that route? Right. Thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon. Uh, I have a problem with the premises of your question. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and because of that, I have difficult answering it as well. Okay. Yeah. Because the agenda of, uh, from <laughs> billions to trillions mm. uh, was born out of uh, two things. An ambition, SDGs, a realization that public resources were limited. Right. And that something had to be done to attract private capital into SDGs. Now, we are not where we should be for reasons which Suma has just articulated. But I think we should not let off the break now and conclude too prematurely, in my view that private markets are not responding to SDGs. Mm. I don't have time to go into this. I've looked at, for example, the green bonds each time they've been issued. You see amazing mm. responses. Uh, I've seen a lot of things happening in Africa uh, where governments have done the right things uh, in infrastructure, in uh, <coughs> uh, manufacturing. And I'm not as pessimistic as you on this one. Okay. This first thing I wanted to say. But having said that, before I answer your debt question, but I have someone from IMF, so I'll have to be very careful <laughs> what I say <laughs> on that. There are three types of challenges for SDGs. There are some SDGs which will continue to require loads of public money. Okay. Loads of public money. You will never attract private capital in those particular areas of SDGs. So that is one basket. There's a basket where private money is coming, even in governments, in areas where governments are not very good. I will tell you about uh, optic fibers, telecommunication, that kind of space, uh, clean energy. Uh, people are figuring out how to go around uh, those policy imperfections. Then there are things in between. This where Suma has a point. We have work to do. I think uh, if our IFIs had done what EBRD is doing, 
maybe because the radis DNA is more private sector. I think it could be or should be, but I think the ecosystem has not yet adjusted okay. to the agenda of billions to trillions. The ecosystem of IFIs and those around it is still behaving in the same way as before. See risk averse, limited instruments, uh, a lot of policy disarticulation. And so I think that uh, there are lessons to be learned from the lack of IBRD and others. Mm. And then maybe in the coming years, we could make a bit more progress. But that does not right now conclude that the private markets will not respond as SDGs. Mm. Now, on that, so what can I say? Uh, except the following. I've read from documents, international organizations, basically five concerns. Number one, the speed of accumulation is too rapid. Okay. From 2013 to 2018, the countries in distress or at risk of distress has increased it has historically high. Second, that uh, the non-Paris Club members, the share of the non-Paris Club debt has increased. Okay. And therefore, in terms of resolution, if ever we came to that, those instruments would not be available. And there is a bit of uh, non party club, there is a big elephant in there, which is often mentioned, sometimes a reflection of Western insecurities than really the debt problem. But I leave that to the IMF. <laughs> <laughs> there is a third issue which I've heard, which is about uh, collateralization. Some countries uh, are accessing these markets by collateralizing their commodities and revenue flows. But I was pleased to hear that uh, there is a party line on this one. If a country has no access to capital markets or is still testing the capital markets, there is nothing wrong with the collateralization as long as it is fully transparent so the other lenders can see what is happening. Uh, and the last thing I've heard is about the mismatches. And here I agree with Suma. These mismatches are a concern. Both currency mismatches, investment mismatches, the space people have to, to figure out how to, to do this. But I wanted to, to say the following, and this is why I fear my friend from my IMF may not invite me again. <laughs> the level of debt held by African countries as a proportion of global debt is infinitesimally so small and is not out of line with a general increase in debt globally since the global financial crisis. If my numbers are right, globally, debt has up by 25%, I think. Same in, in the African countries. Now, the idea that here we go again, we are we're creating the old problem is a misunderstanding of the old problem. The old debt problem in Africa was not created by borrowing from the markets. It was the fact that countries were getting poorer every year because of many reasons and unable to service the debt of the World Bank, the African Bank, and other IFIs. It was concessional loans. But these countries were getting so poor in the 70s, 80s, they were not able to pay. So it was not a debt crisis which is being repeated now. I hope I'm clear on this. That was a completely different type of problem. It was due to the crisis, political, social, security in Africa. So real per capita incomes were declining. Countries were not able to service even very small amounts of debt to the World Bank and the African Development Bank. So these had to be cancelled. This is a separate problem, which I think is now on the radar of many leaders who want to encourage countries to continue testing the market, building a curve, uh, understanding the risk of how things are done. And I think now we are having tools and instruments to make sure it is done properly. But uh, I want to tell you that when many of these countries go to the markets, even poor countries are looking for, I don't know, one billion. The book, the loan book, the loan book which comes, maybe five, six times. So which means the markets are telling us something. Of course, there is a price to everything. And the price is factored in. But the markets still have confidence in the short-term prospects of Africa at this long term. Now, is this an about way of accessing capital markets? Dollars are dollars. Uh, I don't care where they come from, the euro bonds, from the Chinese Exim Bank, or from the private equity firms, as long as they help us to achieve economic growth and SDGs. For me, that is where I stand. Thank you.
Thank you. I will, Madam Minister, I'd like to go to you next um, on, on both of these questions. We, um, this morning, the Ghanaian uh, Minister of Finance was here and he talked about um, trillions of dollars earning low and negative yields. He talked about almost five trillion in cash, most of it um, dry powder that is not being invested. What have you seen? How, have you been able to attract private money into infrastructure in your country? Uh, Egypt has gone to the um, capital market, um, financial markets too and has borrowed, has issued uh, euro bonds. I think Egypt is planning another one from what I've read. Have you, some of the, the, the issues that uh, the EBRD raised, are, how, how are you responding to those, to those issues? Uh, so yes, please, your comments on those. Um, thank you very much. Um, I want to first start by saying if you really want to achieve the SDGs and if you want to achieve sustainable and inclusive economic growth, mm -hmm. one prerequisite is uh, a solid, adequate uh, infrastructure put mm -hmm. in place, whether the energy part, uh, gas or, or, or renewable energy, electricity, uh, infrastructure in terms of connectivity and roads and transportation mm -hmm. overall, but also the ICT infrastructure is is very important, especially in the context of, of Africa. So we've moved on several fronts. So uh, along with the Economic Reform and Structure Adjustment Program, where we, we aimed at achieving the sustainability overall at the macroeconomic level, fiscal and monetary policy, <laughs> we also wanted to make sure that the business environment is conducive. And I think uh, Suma has, has stressed that part, which is how can we attract private sector in overall private investment and foreign direct investment, but also how can we attract the private sector to uh, invest in infrastructure that in the past has not been very attractive and not of high returns, obviously compared to euro bonds or mm. we So first we, we made major legislative uh, reforms okay. uh, with providing tax and non-tax incentives, making sure we provide the assurances and the guarantees for the private sector, especially that Egypt went through uh, some challenging periods, uh, post two revolutions, uprising that has also disrupted the system temporarily. So how can you, you revamp that? And also infrastructure that has been neglected in the past and not really invested in. So this was number one. Second, tapping on funding. And there are various uh, sources. So not necessarily debt financing. So it's true, mm -hmm. EBRG and the World Bank and the uh, European Union, the European Investment Bank, and the Asian infrastructure have been providing loans to the government, which is concessional long term. But we also wanted to make sure that the private sector comes in. And this is where we also reached out to EBRD, private sector arm, and as well as IFC, to support several projects. So Suzuma has highlighted one of our flagship, uh, the BIMBAN, which is also very important to, to to highlight that it's in one of the poorest carbon rates. So it is not just uh, generating energy, but it's also creating jobs mm -hmm. in a lagging region. And uh, it, it is also giving us an opportunity uh, to uh, to scale up with other uh, IFIs, but also bring the private sector in. And now we're negotiating and discussing with several of our African uh, neighbor, neighboring countries to export this energy and to support the infrastructure in neighboring countries, especially that Egypt is now uh, His Excellency President Sisi is presiding and chairing the African mm -hmm. Union. So we want to make use of that to, to also ask uh, um, very credible institutions like uh, EBRG to come in and also finance these regional projects. Because, mm -hmm. because if we're trying, we're, when we talk about SDGs, we're saying no one left behind within a country, but also uh, countries uh, compared mm -hmm. to other countries, but also continents. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to see Africa left behind in, in this, and, and hence, the only way we can achieve growth as we reflect on the experiences in Europe and the US is, is through the connectivity, uh, infrastructure, energy, roads, highways, and ICT, uh, digit, digital overall. Uh, but one important element is also like subsidies and financing was allocated in the past to infrastructure. So by bringing in the private sector, we're able to, to free up a lot of funding to invest in, in human capital. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to just invest in infrastructure, but you want the human capital to also, because they will be managing, you want to ensure the sustainability of these flagship projects. Mm. 
So, so by by going into and that's where the IMF and I see so sitting here and I, you of course, um, the IMF colleague sitting there. So we have managed also through the IMF program and the support of the World Bank to to do a lot of fiscal consolidation to free up so and allocate these funds to investing in human capital, health, and education skills development. So, so I look at it as a, a very well integrated package and. And, uh, and I, I also want to thank International Institution for helping us move forward with this bold and ambitious reform program that allowed us mm -hmm. to have infrastructure projects that would contribute to inclusive growth and achieving the SDGs on not just the, the, the infrastructure uh, goal, but actually all the 17 in terms of partnership goal number 17. Thank you. I, I would like to go to the um, former central bank governor and uh, currently at the IMF, so he can speak from both the government <laughs> side and then from, <laughs> and then from from the from the IMF from the IMF side. Uh, Suma began by talking about that the international financial international financial institutions MDBs have to up their game mm -hmm. if we're going to see billions to trillions. And he talked about and and. Um, the former president of the African Development Bank also mentioned that the current IFIs are not shaped to respond in, in the ways that are, that are required. As a former prime minister, former central bank governor, and now of the IMF, what, what do you think that the international financial institutions need to do for us to be able to see the billions turn into trillions, especially in investment in sustainable infrastructure and investment? Uh, look, uh, it's difficult for me to assess the MDBs, so I will, I will say a few words uh, on, on what I think the international community of all could do. Uh, so I want to begin by saying that, um, as you know, we did recently some work on the costing of the SDGs, mm. and this, the picture is much more alarming than what we had in 2015, because mm. we're talking for the low-income countries about additional spending every year of 15% of GDP. You heard the number of uh, 0.5 trillion that MD said during the, uh, the, the, her speech in September. And yet, when we look to the DFI blended finance, we're talking about a few billion dollars. So, mm. so the gap is huge. So it's really, um, if you look to a continent like Africa and a country like mine, the other also consideration we should keep in mind that this, this is countries with fast growing working age population. So you have a problem. And if you don't really have a rapid growth in these countries, uh, you're not going really to, 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 to be able to maintain even stability in these countries, and you will have huge spillovers abroad. So there is urgency to, to, to do something about it. Clearly, the fiscal space is very limited in all these countries, talking with, so as, as I said before, um, debt vulnerabilities are rising everywhere, and so, there is only so much that the public sector can do. And the only way to fill the gap, both for the SDGs, but also to, 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 to step up to uh, the growth, is really, is really only, only private sector. Um, so that requires um, a coordinated effort between countries mm. and uh, the international community. I said at the beginning, it's very critical that countries actually do their own homework. Right. It's important for, for countries to have a stable macroeconomic environment because without that, no private sector will come. If you can't get ex access to FX or you cannot get access to, uh, to uh, lending or if you have a, a, a debt that is unsustainable, nobody will come and invest in your country. So it's important that these countries have a strong macroeconomic framework, and this is where the IMF has an important role to play, and we are playing that in, in the region. We have almost around 20, 21, 22 programs in, in, in this region, including in Egypt, we, we were talking about right now. So this is where we, we play an important role. We play also an important role in capacity, in capacity development in policy advice in these countries. So the other thing that is, so once the countries do their homework, the international community also should, should play its role. And I see three things, okay. mainly three things. And, and this is also, by the way, the idea we had around the G20 compact with Africa between the 
Africa, compact with Africa, mm. so the African doing their work, and the international community stepping in to help them, is really to have the international community playing two or three important major roles. First, as you know, Africans are complaining about illicit financial flows. And we, when we say that, it's mostly tax avoidance mm. by multinational companies. So there is a huge, actually, leakage in terms of resources for these countries. And this is something that needs to be addressed at the at international level. And, and you've seen the paper we just issued on international corporation taxation, and I think this is an important problem to prove. Second, I think all this idea about blended finance is the right, right way to do it. Um, I think some of the instruments are probably better than others. I think the idea about developing local currency market is an, an important idea. Uh, developing more equity financing that you were lo looking at was also an, an important aspect of, of, of this. Uh, doing some kind of uh, uh, vehicle for investment, like, for example, the MCCP, MCPP that IFC has developed, where you can have high leverage ratio between small support in terms of, for example, first loss facility to actually leverage more private sector resources are also a good idea that, 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 that can be developed. So, so it's important to develop some of these risk mitigation instruments to scale them up because at, at the moment they are, they are too small. Okay. The third contribution that was expected actually in the compact with Africa is most of the risk about Africa are perceived risk. So people don't, don't go to the market, don't see the market, don't know about the market. So there is, a, there is a need to have a global effort to market Africa as a destination for investment. I, I, I can tell you that it's, these countries are fast growing. If you look to the to, to top growing countries, you will top 10 growing countries, you will see every time four, five, six African countries in the top 10. So there are fast growing countries, but all what we need, we hear outside, investors hear outside, and when, when I was policymaker, what, what, what people tell me that they hear outside is really negative noise about Africa. And I think that this has also to, to, to change, and uh, something we were expecting from the Compact with Africa, that G20 countries organizing roadshow for African countries to, to, for their own investors, to market uh, Africa as a destination for investment would be also something that could actually change the, 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 the things on, on the ground. Thank you, thank you. And now we, I want to go to the private sector because we've talked about attracting private money in, into, uh, in, into Africa and Kapanda Capital has invested uh, in Africa. Um, Pricewaterhouse, Pricewaterhouse Cooper uh, uh, estimates that is about a hundred trillion in assets under management and, and projects that by uh, 2025, it will be 125 trillion on, on, in assets under management. Now, all of this capital, you're in Africa. First, how easy it is to attract uh, private capital along with your investment that you've done from outside the continent there? And what has been your experience in terms of deals on the continent, the um, suitability of Africa as, an, as a destination for private capital? Who would like your opinion on this. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Jude. Um, I think, I mean, you know, obviously I was on the public sector side, um, and I think there's some real disconnects, okay. frankly, in the conversation I witness on one side versus the conversation I witness other. So, for example, we've we have three companies today, um, and uh, we've never been able to partner with any BFI on any of those companies to date. Um, but we have raised money from the largest pension funds in the US and to do very creative things, build businesses from scratch, things that I think all of us would agree, no DFI is doing today. And, and in some ways, I think EBRD has shown at times an exception to that. So, um, and I think Suma's point about working with the private sector earlier on is kind of how you get that done. And there's not a real willingness to do that. So by the time, you know, if somebody presents me something, I say, well, that's not how I would have structured it. And you've already spent $15 million structuring something for me to come in, well, that's not how I would have structured it. Why didn't you talk to me um, in the beginning? And I think, for me, some of this starts with this, like, the private sector, which, of course, is such a multifaceted animal by sector and, and by type of investor. And I think, you know, my president or my former president here, I mean, one of the things he did uh, taking over the AFDB, talking to a lot of people here at Center for Global Development, for example, and getting a lot of support here and pressure on governors was to start, you know, start with first a laser focus to say infrastructure, energy, 
now, once I have that focus, I can start being a little audacious. You know, and so if you take a project like Lake Turkana Wind, which is a project that I think AFDB should get a lot of credit for. Mm. I mean, starting with the early survey assessments, to the financing, to the risk offtake, that was a project that repeatedly my colleagues across DFIs told me was not bankable. Which again, I think Sue made this point, well, why do we exist if it's not to work on projects that aren't bankable? Mm. Uh, you know, that's the whole reason DFIs exist. That's the reason you get taxpayer money. Um, but it's amazing the, the, the resistance to that. But I think it starts with the focus first, right, and being, and being in the details. So if you think now for us, when I think about what are the things I care about, and I'll be honest, a lot of these macro issues I don't care about mm. as a, an investor today. I care about a lot more about the micro mm. than the macro. My biggest issue is, is capital controls and exchange rate. I mean, if I'm going to go build something and invest my time, you look at what happened in Nigeria a couple years ago, it literally wiped out anybody who was really trying to grow a business as a foreign equity investor in Nigeria over. And that's going to be hard now to repair. If I go and present a business, people say, well, if I would have made this investment in 2015, even if the business did very well on the ground, I would have lost money uh, because of policy. So that one is, is one. And then two, uh, it's not inconsistent with your point, is, is, is market size. And so, you know, the work that's being done right now across Africa to, 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 to really lower the frictions across markets is a big deal because if I'm going to spend a lot of time building a, a, a new entity or a business, I want to make sure I can get scale. And so for Nigeria, that's, that's straightforward. Maybe even for like in Ethiopia, that's straightforward. But for Togo, mm. it's not. But it is if I know from Togo, I can go to Benin, I can go to Mali, I can go to Burkina Faso. Like that's, that's, that's when it starts being really interesting. But I think, I think you know, the last point I'll make is just, <clears throat> you know, and of course a lot of people know now, you know, we, we recently announced an investment in a record label in Nigeria, which is an export business, right. really, today. Um, we make most of our money in the UK, in the US, uh, in Forex. Most of our costs are in local currency. So, um, but if I had the bar of, uh, and that's why we're not a fund, right? We're an operating holding company. Because if I just went and said, I want to invest in a record label, the answer is there's no investable record label. That's the answer to that mm. question. We spent three years working with a party on the ground to make their operation suitable for our investment. We were willing to do that, and I think we'll get a return on all of that work. But there's not a lot of that on the, on the public side today, and maybe there shouldn't be. Maybe the public side should be figuring out how to work with players on the private side to do that. But that's fundamentally what's needed to me to start to like catalyze these larger numbers. And I think, you know, when you hear these examples from EBRD and AFDB, that's essentially what happened. You had project managers who really took risks, sometimes against their own KPIs, to get projects ready in concert with the private sector. And that has, and, and I would say, you look at those projects, we're talking about hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of private money capitalized in. But it wasn't because of a speech or like, you know, someone like me who was like a staffer who just did some arithmetic on some multiple and said trillions, right? It was really kind of this, these, these work of these, you know, people who pushed things along and probably did things that weren't exactly consistent with even uh, the institution's policies. Um, and that's, I think, what we need to learn from and see if we can institutionalize that much more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will go to my colleague here, uh, Nancy Lee. Nancy, you've done a lot of uh, work research on blended financing. You've written about this. And uh, having heard from both the practitioners, um, from the, the IFIs and the former practitioners, what, we would like your, your, your comments on, on what you've heard so far in, in terms of how we can get billions to actually become trillions. Well, thanks, Jude, and that is the wonderful thing about being in a think tank. I can <laughs> entirely speak freely, um, not constrained <laughs> by putting my money at risk or advising anybody uh, being inside a development bank. Um, maybe uh, it would be most useful if I sort of tried to pull together, um, t well, at least two threads in this conversation, because it's interesting to me that there's a juxtaposition of a very what really is a very positive story about what's happening in African economies um, and a very sort of bleak picture when you look at the actual finance that's being mobilized to finance the SGGs. I mean, this is a region with some of the fastest growing economies in the world. They are no longer exclusively resource-rich countries. 
your resource endowment no longer determines your growth destiny in this, in this um, set of economies. Um, we know that inside economies, uh, the drivers of growth are, are diversifying. It's no longer entirely consumption. In 2018, the contribution of investment to growth equaled that of consumption. We see uh, a set of economies with much more diversity in terms of trading partners, growth in Asian, uh, South Asian, um, Mideast trading partners. Same is true for foreign direct investment, although China is really playing the dominant role in the increase in foreign direct investment, as distinct from um, debt. So, uh, and, and the research we're doing shows that for non-resource rich, low income countries in Africa, the ratio of foreign direct investment to GDP is actually higher than the ratio for resource-rich countries. So we're seeing foreign direct investment become a much more important source of finance. Actually, now is as important as um, development assistance in terms of financing economies. So all of that is great news, OK? Then you turn to the question of uh, finance for infrastructure and the uh, sustainable development goals. and. Um, we're seeing, actually, trends in the wrong direction. Um, finance for infrastructure in Africa it has fallen, not risen. Um, finance for infrastructure where there is some private participation in the transaction has, has really plunged from a peak of something like 10 billion in, um, this is for the whole continent, 10 billion in 2013 to something like two and a half billion in uh, 2017. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing uh, a, a really a marginal role on the part of the multilateral development institutions in financing infrastructure in Africa. According to the African um, Development Bank, it's something like 3% of infrastructure finance in Africa comes from the multilaterals. About 8% comes from the private sector, and something like 15% comes from uh, China. Most of it comes from governments, from local governments and from um, donor governments. So we're, we're really, and, and that's kind of odd when you think about it, because if, there are, is there, if there's any set of institutions that have all of the tools you need to do infrastructure, it's the multilateral development banks. Mm. They have project development finance. They have technical assistance. They have support for the policy and institutional reform that Suma was talking about. They have the ability to lend to governments. They have the ability to lend to the private sector. They have the ability to put equity um, in investments. So uh, they have you know, risk sharing products like insurance and guarantees. They have it all. There is no other, no other set of institutions that have that range of instruments to bring to bear. So, I think you can say perhaps that the international community's expectations of the multilaterals uh, was, was, were too high. Um, I would argue that uh, a spotlight on these institutions is not unreasonable um, in this context. So um, I think, uh, you know, what, 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 what is the, what are the set of solutions to this? I think. For one thing, um, the, the public concessional finance, um, such as the IDA finance, has to be a big part of the picture. Because I, I do think a lot of infrastructure is simply not going to um, have a large private sector role in low-income countries where the commercial pro proposition for infrastructure is just not there. But there also has to be a private sector role. I mean, uh, the IMF has estimated that for low-income countries, um, the, the additional amount of spending that's necessary to actually meet the strategic, uh, the, the sustainable development goals is something like 14 percentage points of GDP. So you can start mobilizing additional revenue, and you get to maybe 5% more. You know, I'm sure you know these numbers. Um, but you still have this large gap. So I think... It, this is not an either or proposition. It has to be a multifaceted solution. So I think this has to be an important part of the IDA replenishment discussions. Um, and you know, what happens in terms of infrastructure investment in the development banks? Um, and do they need to focus more? 
They also, of course, need to focus on building human capital and social investments. But these kinds of allocation decisions, I think, need to be front and center, as well as the overall envelope of IDA. But let me just focus for just a minute about on the private finance arms of these banks. So I, I would not suggest that the solution to this problem is a huge additional infusion of capital in the private um, finance arms. <clears throat> what, what I would suggest is that there really have to be some significant changes to the model itself. Mm. And, uh, and so let me suggest four uh, changes, which I think are pretty fun fundamental um, for your consideration. The first is I think there needs to be a new capital <coughs> structure added to the existing capital structure, one that sits in between essentially grant finance and highly concessional finance over here and market finance, market return finance over here. There has to be something in the middle with, with low market returns or even just preservation of capital that can enable these institutions to manage risk. Mm. I would suggest that um, it be focused on where the capital market gaps are. We've talked about local currency financing, to me, early stage financing for firms mm -hmm. and for infrastructure is another huge, it's essentially the capital market gap that Bobby was talking about. I think this structure needs to be global in scope and it needs to serve multiple um, multilateral institutions. I don't think you need one for every single institution. There's no reason why it can't combine capital from governments as well as capital from very risk tolerant impact investors like foundations or philanthropic investors. Um, and as I said, the goal should be uh, a below market return goal so that the balance sheets of these institutions, which is of great concern to their shareholders, are uh, protected from the, the uh, effects of this greater risk tolerance. Okay, so that's, that to me is the big financial structural change that has to happen in order to be able to preserve what's good about these institutions while at the same time increasing their development and mobilization impact. Just three other things let me mention. The first is, as Suma was saying, um, critical to, to uh, um, do the work on the policy, the regulatory, the legal environment, as well as the project development work um, that's necessary to create good projects and good firms. Um, so really this breaking down the silos within these institutions so that they can bring these tools together more effectively is critical. There's been a lot of talk about this. Um, uh, I think it's a central, uh, to me it is the central management challenge of multilateral development banks to be able to bring what is their comparative advantage to, to bear by breaking down these silos. Um, the other thing is to be able to collaborate across institutions. This is something that the um, eminent persons group reported to the G20 to so that these institutions can work as a system, so that they can achieve scale, so that they can share risk, take on more risk and share risk across the institutions, as well as share these costs of project development and support for reform. And then the last thing I'll say is sort of more conceptual which is I think it's time for these institutions to take a look at the policy advice that they give to low-income countries in particular on how to make the jump to middle income and high income. Um, and still in practice, if you go to these institutions and you ask them what industrial policies to pursue, they'll say, take a look at your comparative advantage, Fix your overall investment climate. Don't start picking winners and losers. Don't start subsidizing individual sectors. You, you are not well placed to innovate. You should try to source innovation through foreign direct investment. But if you look at the East Asian countries that actually made the jump from low income countries to high income countries, they didn't follow any of that advice. <laughs> They didn't in the 20th century, and this is even more relevant in the 21st century where you have this incredibly rapid technological change, artificial intelligence. So the whole sort of manufacturing export um, growth model uh, just seems um, uh, highly uh, questionable 
for all of these countries to pursue. So I, I think they should be taking a look, with the help of research organizations, uh, to at, at really what, what is the kind of advice to go from a low-income country to a high-income country. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Now, one of the great things of coming to events like this is the opportunity to get the audience to actually ask questions, because you know we may not absor um, exhaust all of the questions that could be. One of the things I would ask in responding to the questions, find a way to be able to address it, is you know the elephant in the room that we haven't spoken about and the role of China and Chinese firms, especially in terms of the financing that they can bring to bear, especially because of their, their risk appetite uh, in, in terms of the perception of risk uh, uh, on the continent. If so, keep that in mind, and we will now go to the audience for questions. I see one hand. This is unusual. <laughs> okay, um, two. Yeah. Okay, I see three three questions. Uh, Stacy Warden from the Milken Institute. I, it seems to me that a very good way to get private sector involvement in infrastructure assets, um, in cooperation with the multilateral development banks, is to do some balance sheet shedding at those institutions themselves. So um, um, yeah, so if you could please comment on that. I know that there has been some initiatives at the African Development Bank with Bobby and, and, and President Kabaruka and Bertrand Bradre made a couple of initiatives to do that and I'm just wondering how that's going because that seems to me to be a very um, uh, a good way to let the private sector dip their toe in these markets and um, get some protection uh, there. Thanks. Thank you, Stacey. There's a lady behind. Uh, you had your hand up, yeah? yeah? Yeah. And then here. Uh, Morgan Tucker with Catholic Relief Services Impact Investing Team. I would love to hear more about um, not just foreign investment into these countries, but as well as unlocking existing local capital and existing foreign investment in countries. We work in the blended finance and impact investing space, mostly with small medium enterprises. And we find that there's a lot of capital in these countries, which may be a drop in the bucket compared to foreign investment, but that's still important to drive growth in small and medium enterprises, which provide a lot of employment and opportunity for the people we're trying to reach. Um, so I'd love to hear more about your perspective on how we can unlock more of this capital and um, how important it is to development um, in this space. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Zaid with the Tony Blair Institute uh, for Global Change. I just want to pick up on your point, Nancy, about um, industrial policy, um, which I think is really uh, quite crucial. And I'd like to ask what is what are the right uh, mechanisms that we should start thinking about to provide support structures for governments to get industrial policy right? Industrial policy, which is trade-friendly, market-based, um, and which is not just actually about developing manufacturing sectors, it's about developing all sectors, mm -hmm. collaborating with pioneer firms like the ones that um, um, uh, Bobby mentioned, uh, but also that can be s politically smart as well, because a lot of the barriers that governments face uh, often political barriers, vested interests that like the status quo, that are happy with the status quo. Think of fuel in Nigeria as being the key reason why Nigeria struggles with electricity until today. So how do we give governments the tools to coordinate amongst themselves, not just nominally by having community, you know, committees and so on for coordination, but really to change the political dynamics and the vested interests to show that there's a win-win uh, and align the political economy. Uh, and I think that's quite crucial also for uh, for addressing the bankable project uh, deficit that there is in, in infrastructure as well, because we can make infrastructure just more targeted uh, and more uh, uh, and leveraging the limited resources that exist in a number of different ministries. Thank you. Uh, we, I think we should take two more questions and then we just give the panel an opportunity to wrap and then. Hi, I'm Rob Mossbacker, former president of OPIC and on the board at CGD. Um, so Nancy provided uh, an option in terms of how to uh, enable institutions that are uh, concerned about both the cost of developing deals at the bottom of the pyramid, the size, the, the, the man hours involved and so forth, uh, as well as uh, the risk and the potential impact of that risk on your balance sheet. Uh, I, I'd like to know what would it take uh, for most of the institutions to actually look at the bottom of the pyramid and say, we have to make these extraordinary efforts to get there. Uh, 
-hmm. and the excuses or explanations we've had in the past no longer suffice. Thank you. And then you. Yes, sir. Um, I am El Hajba from the African Development Bank. So um, for me, when often I hear the from billions to trillions, I'm thinking we focus too much on the finance side, but we don't focus on where to use that uh, those trillions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Suma talked about the project preparation, doing these projects. They did the, the deals in Egypt, that is a middle-income country, but go in the low-income countries. We struggle sometimes to find projects that we can finance, right? So where, what do we need to do to scale up the project preparation and finance uh, these the find uh, finance entrepreneurs and so on so that we can really channel these trillions because even if they are earning zero but they need to find uh, avenues to be invested thank you thank you uh, then uh, we just take one last question and then uh, we'll give the panel an opportunity to respond yeah jerry manarola was with you say liberia so a good friend of yours uh, David Warnova, right. who's a colleague of ours. I wanted to follow up um, on the industrial policy question. Seems to me that what differentiated the success of Asia and the abject failure of Latin America and Africa was strong governments that were willing to say no if their subsidies, in cases where their subsidies didn't work, whereas the politics in Latin America and Africa didn't let that happen, except nowadays for Rwanda and you could say um, Ethiopia as well. So the question is for, for you all, in democracies, how do you have a successful industrial policy? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so just before we give the, the, the uh, Canada an opportunity to answer that question. <laughs> I thought um, just to highlight uh, things that came up here, on, on the part of the states, there, there seems to be, especially with the news coming out of Ghana today, and, and Ghana uh, um, graduating from the IMF program, is in terms of the quality of Ghanaian institutions over the long term, the stability that Ghana has enjoyed. So for, from the countries in Africa perspective, to be able to attract the private sectors, the quality of infrastructure, uh, inf institutions, the quality of, of, of the, the regulatory environment. But we've also heard questions about what uh, that currently the multilateral development banks and IFIs do not seem to be structured to be able to deliver the kind of financing that is needed in those places. And so those are two, two of the main points that were raised. Uh, now we'll go in the same order, but no, we'll just go directly and then he, he'll close that and then um, answer any of the questions you you you, you want and with, with parting comments, please. I thought, I thought that was a magnificent, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, oxymoron almost. Can you have a successful in industrial policy in a democracy? It's impossible, no. Um, <laughs> look, I think the East Asia example is interesting what Nancy says, but there are, some interesting issues around it, which is a big focus on tradable sector, mm -hmm. which, uh, I mean, John Page, I remember, did this great study in the early 90s at the World Bank, which showed actually it was a tradable uh, focus that really made a major difference. But, and I would say some of the problems that came from it also is the vested interest capture, the chai bowl issues we've seen in Korea and others. So there are some downsides to that as well. But I take the point there is a challenge, I think, to the market model, uh, mm -hmm. there, which we have to face up to as well. Can I try and focus on Robert's... Uh, to see an old friend of mine. And Robert's uh, question about bottom of the pyramid, I think I could answer this in the same way your question, sir, as well, because I could answer it for low-income countries or for SMEs. I mean, it's a similar sort of problem. And for me, there is no answer to this other than throwing a huge amount of resources at it. Mm. You cannot spirit up these deals by just, you know, why is it I sat in a cafe, I think it was a Costa Cafe or a Starbucks in Cairo. Yes, it was a middle-income country, but we. this is back in late 2012 with a team of four people. That was our team at the time. No, no great surprise that by the end of the year, we'd only done $70 million worth of private sector financing in, uh, in, uh, in uh, MENA at that time. Whereas now, I mean, Janet here, managing director for the region, I think she has a team of at least 70 in Cairo and we're running out of space all the time. But <laughs> yeah. what has really made the difference isn't just Cairo, is actually our willingness then to open smaller offices in Alexandria, in Asyut, in Ismailia, really to try and get the SME sector going. Mm. And that's the domestic capital point as well. 
how to make domestic capital work. Uh, there is money out there. And domestic investors are looking for similar things to foreign investors are looking for. Mm. But there's a lot more work that's required through the local banking system, through credit lines and so on, to get the bankers to think about what makes for a successful investment as well. And there is no answer to that other than we've got to throw more money at it. So our matrix is you know, quite heavy country presence, uh, really to be able to do that, to work with the government on policy issues, as well as having these big sector teams in London. And it's resource intensive. Um, but that's why our new idea, our average uh, ticket size is about $25 million. Uh, whereas you compare with the BID, which is nearly $50 million. And they're operating at a different level, I think, because we're doing so many of these very small ticket uh, uh, projects as well. But you can't do them successfully unless you put a lot of human resources into it, I think, as well. Just one thing on China, maybe, while I've got the floor. Please. I'm sort of um, a bit worried about uh, we're moving from a, we in the West are moving from a sort of over enthusiastic engagement to an over enthusiastic disengagement mm. with the Chinese. I think, you know, frank, fa fact is, China is a heterogeneous place, just like we are. Mm. It's got liberals and conservatives, people who share our values, people who don't. And I think it's very important for the MDBs to continue to engage with China, those parts of the Chinese system that actually have very similar opinions to what we do about values, environmental and social ones, procurement standards, all of those things. So I, I think we really ought to steer a careful course on this. It's wonderful that EBRD, one of the things that's happened I think, in the last uh, six, seven years is that uh, we've moved from 61 shareholders to 70. Uh, other than the AIAB, mm -hmm. we're the only one that's growing, multilateral, and China and India have joined. And now San Marino has joined, so we, we cater, for, <laughs> cater for the large and the small, you know, in the BID. So, um, but it's great because, and the reason they've joined is not to be a country of operations. No, the Chinese have joined because they wanted uh, Chinese uh, to come and work at EBID, take some of the business model lessons back to the state banks, state development banks. And I think that's a really good thing. I think that's what we should be fostering for more of. So I think there is a way of engaging with China, which isn't always a negative spiral, actually. Thank you. Look, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 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 I can be very brief. Uh, I have just four points to make. Number one uh, is the only African on this panel, apart from the official from <laughs> the IMF. Summer. No, no, no. He's an official of the IMF. We're, we're sharing the African Union. <laughs> <laughs> what about me? So, <laughs> so let me let me tell you something. <laughs> I, I did not buy this pessimistic mood about Africa here. I think my colleague from Egypt maybe mentioned that mm -hmm. things are happening. In the last six months, mm -hmm. I've gone through seven brand new airports. In Dakar, in Lome, in Accra, in Addis, in uh, there's one coming up in Dar es Salaam, my own country. I've stopped counting the number of new dams coming up. And why am I saying all this? In all this, the i is are missing. Mm. Because here, the conclusion I'm hearing that the i will have to be ahead of the, uh, the queue. I think they will have to be somewhere in the middle of the queue. Mm -hmm. These things are happening without the i uh, The G20 tried after the French chairmanship to, to set up an infrastructure group, uh, got the i to do the right things. It didn't happen. So I'm less sanguine that this time around, even the level of demands, that the, uh, the IFAs will be in the lead. They will have to re-engineer themselves. I think tomorrow you have the new head of the World Bank. Please ask him. I think you have a decision. So, and you have the, the EPG meeting here. It's a good place to start. So this is my second point. We have to be realistic what IFAs can do and can't do. There's some issues that are self-imposed. Others are external to, to them. And that brings me to Stacey's uh, question about sweating the balance sheet. We are successful to do that because the shareholders were pushing us. Pushing us because they wanted us to open up the balance sheet for North Africa. Mm -hmm. At the time, Egypt had been downgraded and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And because the African development bank in particular, the exposure to the Northern African region was about 45%. And the Inter-American bank was largely exposed to Argentina. We are looking for ways of bringing the bigger balance sheet of the World Bank. But it took us a year and a half to have it done. 
if it can be done, and the shareholders agree to sweat the balance sheet over the institutions, then this action on infrastructure can be done. Mm. My last point is about uh, macro policy, uh, Bobby. South Africa right now is suffering uh, power cuts. Uh, ESCOM is having issues. It's not lack of money. It's not lack of uh, bankable projects. It's not lack of de-risking instruments. It is something else. Mm. And therefore, that has to be fixed. And it's like to be between the macro issues and uh, institutional issues. If those are not fixed, it, it can't be done. My last point is about China. And I go straight to what Suma said. I listened to one of the senior officials uh, in this country talk about the, their new Africa policy. And it has got three elements. Promoting US commercial interests in Africa. Fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Countering China. And three, of course, Islamic radicalism. Now, there's nothing wrong with any country promoting their commercial interests in another region. But I think China is such a major player now that to think that you can counter the interest by actually stifling economic development in some other regions, it won't work. The incentives are not aligned. Mm. All right? You remember the 1970s, after the plaza got on the currencies? Japanese currencies went up, and so Japanese were looking to invest outside of Japan. And they invested in the southeastern region. And everybody's a winner. We need to find a way of actually incentivizing China to do exactly what Japan did in Southeast Asia, mm. which is investing in the ASEAN region, investing in the African region, rather than trying to say we're going to compete with them in the theater of competition will be poor countries who have need investments. Mm. But otherwise, I think this is interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Nancy? Um, OK, so let me, let me say a word about uh, developing local capital markets, um, a little bit about industrial policy, and then the question of what, what would it take. So um, I, I would say that the question of local mobilizing local capital and project development um, is are, are related and uh, which is why I think a very explicit focus on the early stage finance ecosystem mm. has to be a much bigger play a much larger role um, in the MDB uh, uh, strategies I mean th th there is just a huge capital market gap and it is both on the um, capacity side as well as on the actual finance side. I mean, you know, um, developing uh, fund managers, um, developing the capacity to, uh, developing this sort of policy and regulatory ecosystem for early stage finance, um, developing, and, and this is very much linked with um, local finance capital markets. So I, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, the focus should really be, it should not be a sectoral focus, it should be more of a focus on where the capital market gaps are and having the developing banks actually occupy those capital market gaps as well instead of sort of piling into the same space that the private sector um, or, or is in. Now, that means taking on more risk, mm. which means, uh, you know, there needs to be some sort of financial capacity to take on more risk. And let's be clear, the... This is not simply a manage, management staff, you know, kind of inherent conservatism with respect to risk. The models are set up to, uh, for, to with a certain risk tolerance, and the shareholders certainly, uh, on the one hand, are telling the banks to sort of yep. be in the most difficult environments and do the most difficult projects, but you better keep these yep. institutions AAA rated, and you better come up with um, <laughs> profits that add to your equity because we're sure not going to add to your capital. Yep. I mean, I'm making <laughs> 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 Is that, that distorted? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, in other words, you can't just tell them to take more risk without giving them the tools to take more risks. Is, I think, the point that I was making. And all right, so let me just jump to what, what does it take? I think. The, the good news is that if you set up this additional capital market structure, it doesn't have to be huge because if we're talking about sort of very risk tolerant early stage finance, in, in that part of the capital stack, it's smaller than all the senior debt and the, the other part that is, is actually more 
that the private sector is more willing to occupy. And in addition, you can set up a whole new shareholding structure. You aren't constrained by the existing shareholder structure in these institutions, which is always very difficult to change the structure if you, um, if you are trying to do something uh, different. Um, and you could also set up a, a vehicle that would serve multiple institutions. And in that way, you could build in incentives to get the institutions to collaborate with each other. So in order to access this very risk-tolerant money in this new structure, you could make that access contingent on projects in which the several institutions collaborate in order to achieve scale. So, so you, you can make the case um, that this solves some of the problems that can confront shareholders. And then one more thing on industrial policy, and this really comes from this new IMF paper on, I don't forget what it's called, something like the policy that shall, that shall not, not be, be named. named. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the interesting thing is, um, Suma is absolutely right, it, these are tradable goods, but somehow um, the uh, requirements to perform on exporting right. were built into the incentive system. You had to, so this was not import substitution. This was, um, you know, we're, we're going to subsidize various parts of this operation, but um, we're going to uh, create a competition to, it, to get access to the subsidies. On the, for, so various firms would compete for those subsidies. And you really had to perform in terms of export, which imposed a competitive dynamic on the, on the operation. And, and one other thing that this paper said, which I thought was really interesting, was um, the part of the strategy was to innovate at home, local innovation. So um, it was the, these, these countries chose sectors that were far outside their comparative advantage, and they very explicitly um, invested in R&D in order to innovate, to build their own capacity to innovate, and to achieve success in these sectors. So, and I think that's very rel relevant for Africa. I, I think um, getting out of this mindset that Africa just has to receive innovation from other parts of the world is, is really important for its growth strategies. <clears throat> Thank you, Nancy. Madam Minister. Yes, um, engagement uh, with all stakeholders is critical. So from Including Egypt's them. perspective, mm -hmm. we are engaging, of course, with the IMF on macroeconomic. <laughs> I think macro is a prerequisite. For, to attract any, to, before we address the micro, I think it's very important to have the macroeconomic stability. So we're engaging with, I agree so very much with Suma, we are engaging, for example, with China, with Asian Infrastructure Bank, with EBRG, and with the African Development Bank, with the World Bank. I think that's very important. EU is also providing a lot of support. And when Suma referred to Egypt as number one in terms of country operations, and EBRG were also number one in the bank. Uh, and more important is that it's not all debt, so it's not all the government is borrowing and reaching out. In fact, on the contrary, the, the, these IFIs have supported us in terms of moving with a very bold and ambitious economic reform program that allowed us to bring the private sector in and scale up, and that's very important. And here the private sector is not just the large corporate and the large company, but actually small and medium enterprises. Let me take examples, not just the renewable energy, but Water and sanitation, this is very important for Africa and for Egypt. So this is where the SMEs are coming in. And actually local SMEs from the governor rates, that, because you know it's community driven also. So you're creating jobs for the young people that are providing these services to their communities and to their, to their families. The airport, uh, in fact, has been also financed by IFI. So we are also diversifying and looking into all the infrastructure that it takes. I think one important, point that we need to also refer to on this panel is that why are we talking about infrastructure? Why are we talking about attracting FDI? I think that's the most important question is you want to make sure that you are providing the best services to your people, you're improving their standard of living, you're, you're generating, creating jobs. So I'm not, my concern is not just uh, looking at numbers because you mentioned numbers. I, I totally agree with you. It's not why would I just monitor FDI and look, is it is it going up? Is it going down? What matters to me is the quality of FGI. Uh, is this FGI creating jobs? Is this FGI providing value added? Is it bringing knowledge and management to, to my country? That's the FGI that I really want to attract. 
um, and that, that's what will will actually help me uh, meet my ultimate objective which is sustainable and inclusive growth so I want to grow so why do I care about infrastructure because that would help me promote more in investments uh, uh, more industries right uh, uh, and and also again uh, have see more development in your nation I think this is one target that we should not be missing while we're discussing infrastructure and FDI. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. that. Bobby? Yeah, thanks. Um, Just to add to um, my, my former boss, uh, to Stacey, to your point on, on, on the balance sheet side, I think um, for me it was amazing how hard those things are to do both internally and with the board because of the culture. You know, after you've worked on a deal and closed the transaction and you have this exciting transaction in your portfolio, the last thing you want to do is for someone else to be able to see it or experience it or benefit from it. And even me, I have to be honest, Lake Turkana, the project I talk about, you know, in the final few months right before we were closing, you know, I started to get calls from my colleagues, the ones who told me the deal wasn't bankable, the ones who castigated me in public to make fun of me for working on it, to say, hey, can you make a little room for us? Um, it's a hard one. But long term, letting them in and letting them go around and celebrate, maybe it changes their culture over time. I don't know. But, but I think that cultural piece is, is, is really tough. And I don't know the answer. And I think to Nancy's point, I mean, even when I think about the things Nancy's talking about, getting into the development side, Robin, like what you asked, obviously that's the space we're in, developing the deal. And what I would just urge is, you know, I think when the development institutions themselves have tried to do it. It hasn't worked well. And I think Suma made the point earlier, to, to help partner with platforms, help partner with the private sector early. It's hard. It's hard from a procurement standpoint. It's hard using public sector money. There's no doubt. But that's where you get the long-term benefit. And I would argue today, a lot of DFIs don't even do things like supporting you know, larger private equity platforms. So they're trying to do equity themselves directly. There's no kind of knock-on impact from that. Whereas if they're investing in building these institutions, these platforms, there's a huge knock-on effect. I mean, you think about some of these entities we know that, have, that, that are really oppressive teams building infrastructure, private infrastructure projects across Africa. Most of them struggle to get you know, real risk equity into their platform. They raise it from the same places I raise money from, institutional investors in the U.S. And that's something that has to change. So you know, I agree with Nancy, and I think, Nancy, you're making this point. I think we have to like, support the platforms. And, and the last thing, just to agree with Nancy, is we have to be honest that part of the biggest contributor to these cultural problems is the shareholders. And we don't talk about it. I mean, it's the same point I would, I would just add to my boss's point on the last debt crisis, where the reality was money, debt was allocated from MDBs based on performance, but it was debt. And then we turned around and cast it, so we said, congratulations, Senegal, here's more money. And then the next year we castigated them for taking on too much debt. And <laughs> You know, the system was the problem, right? Which, of course, is very different than what's, than what's happening now. And I think the same thing is true when you think about an energy project today. When I was at AFDB, we were told by the board repeatedly, you can only do this project if you get a sovereign guarantee. And then those same shareholders walk across the street to the IMF and say, don't you dare give any sovereign guarantees to any project. I mean, it's the same people, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's the same people. So, you know, we have to figure some of these things out. And I think, you know, the shareholders themselves have to be part of that conversation and, 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 and think, yeah, absolutely. Or talk to themselves. Sometimes it's literally the same person, you know? So I, I, I just think we have to be honest about some of that, you know, if we're, if we're going to start to fix it. Uh, three points from my side. First, on the question on uh, SME access to finance and financial inclusion, I think this is an important uh, issue. Uh, in addition to the point uh, already raised by Nancy, I think the biggest issue in some of these markets is the lack of financial infrastructure. So if you cannot really assess risk, and that you don't have credit bureau, credit registry, you don't have a strong financial infrastructure, it's very hard to get ready to the good project and finance a good project. I think the other problem is also uh, fiscal policies in many of these places. Uh, the, the, st the state is actually the main borrower and it's, it's mm. really crowding out the private sector. And if you look to the composition of debt, you will find that 55% of, pub for the, the, 
public debt owner so is is actually from the domestic debt market so so basically the state is crowding out private investment and and access to finance in some of these countries so that's the two issues that i, I want to just add to to the point raised by Nancy on, 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 the, on that market. I think the other point that she raised on industrial policies as an institution, we recognize that countries will do, by nature will do kind of industrial policies, but our focus will remain on macro policies, horizontal policies, because this is our advantage comparative as an institution, so where we really can help them. And if I, I listen to him uh, saying more concerned about capital control, mm. access to FX, these are the things we can help with, and we can help with better than actually adventuring to, to, to other things. The other point that I want to also uh, stress a little bit related to this is the issue of governance. I, I won't call it democracy or election, but governance in general. And I think the point also raised by on, on, on in the case of South Africa, all these actually raise the, the issue of governance. And I know when we did, for example, this survey to G20 investors for Africa, what is the single issue you worry about? They, they say governance and corruption. So it's, it's basically we need, we need to be a bit, a bit careful, not really push toward a way where the government will be the one who will be picking firms or sectors. So, so this is something we need to be a bit careful about it. But I think your point is right. Probably to move up the ladder, they will need to do some of these, these policy, but do them, do them very well. The last point, I want to say one point on the elephant in the room. <laughs> so what I want to say is that this is happening with the AFIs or without the, AFI, the IFIs. And so our position as an institution, and we have been very active with China on the BRI, is really to say this has to be done the right way in terms of... so and. Countries have to have this right framework, and you, China, would have to have the right framework in terms of debt transparency, in terms of uh, the way, uh, so the, the, in terms of uh, transparency, in terms of competition, in terms of safeguards. So all these things, we need to play a role in making that, this happen in the, in the best way for, for, for our member countries. And I, I think we cannot really say we, we're going to step, to, to, to step back and, and stay, stay away from this. Thank you, sir. Could you please join me in and, and thank the panel for, 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 for the panel. And uh, because it's the, the IMF World Bank meetings, we have a, an event right after this one, so if you could please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, guys. Hey, thank you. 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 Thank